Hello everybody, my name's Jamie Coleman. I'm a software developer advocate for IBM and today I'm going to talk to you about the Earth's coolest data centers. So I'm gonna start off with talking about why I want to talk about the data centers. Um, firstly, what got me interested in data centers is right next to my desk there is a rather large data center which we use for testing and development in my lab in Hursley. Um, for the product I work for, which is Open Liberty, uh, we do a lot of testing. We create 20,000 virtual machines per week. Um, we run about 1,000 of them at the same time at a push, and we test on 190 different operating systems and JDK combinations each weekend. So this is a few images of our um, data center in Hursley. It's not a very big data center, it's just really used for development. Um, 525 racks and around 4,500 systems. Uh, I do love going in there, I love hearing the noise. Um, one of my favorite machines in the data center is the uh, tape machine. So when you use some of the, um, if you use Kix or know what Kix is, when you're recovering data sets or getting some information from uh, one of the tape drives, it's kind of like a vending machine, which is quite cool. It grabs the tape, picks it up, moves it along, and then puts it into uh, the machine, and then you can access your data. So this data center is kind of got what got me interested in data centers. So first of all, I'm gonna give you some random facts about data centers. So there's over 7,500 major data centers in the world, so this is not including little ones that companies have in their own offices, and this isn't including like the one we have in Hursley. Um, and 2,600 of these are in 20, uh, the 20 top global cities. London has the most, um, with just over 300, and the Natural Resource Defense Council um, estimates that data centers can currently consume about 3% of all the energy electricity on the planet. So let's put some things into perspective here. So on the internet, um, the traffic we, that goes through every hour is enough to fill 7 million DVDs. So this will scale Mount Everest 95 times, and this is just per hour. Um, if you include all the smaller data centers in the world, there's over 500,000. That's 6,000 football pitches worth of data centers or soccer pitches if you're American. So let's talk about some of the environmental impacts of these data centers. So by 2020, one third of all data we produce will pass through the cloud and through data centers. Um, currently, 1.2 trillion gigabytes of data per year and they predict in the next year or so, one-fifth of all electricity consumption on the planet will be consumed by data sensors. I mean, that's a lot of energy. So look at cities like this. You've got New York, you've got Vegas, that's lit up like a Christmas tree, Beijing and Hong Kong, but yet in the next few years, data centers are gonna consume one-fifth of all the electricity on the planet. That's quite a scary thought. So let's have a look what cloud providers are actually doing to reduce their carbon footprint. If they're gonna start consuming one-fifth of all the energy supply, they must be doing something, right? So AWS pretty much started the cloud revolution. Um, they had spare capacity in their data centers, and what they did was they rented that out to different parts of Amazon. Um, so one part of Amazon in one country would use a bit, um, and another part service of Amazon would use it elsewhere. And then they had the idea, well, why don't we rent this out to the world. And that is pretty much how the cloud revolution started. Um, they have a brilliant page. If you follow the link on the screen there, um, that tells you about what they're, basically what they want to do in, return, in regards to sustainability. I think they've reached in 2018 about 50% renewable energy in their data centers, which is a brilliant start. So then we go to IBM. Now IBM's been in the data center game a very long time. We've been setting up mainframes for 10, 20, 30 years. And the two pictures on the top, well, the picture on the top left and the bottom right, these are essentially pictures taken from our data center that we just use for development. So simply putting glass doors around the racks um, and putting a glass roof on saves quite a bit of energy. Something else IBM did which was quite clever. Um, so the main byproduct of data centers when you're consuming all this energy is heat. So we had a data center in Scandinavia and 
next to us was a swimming pool. So we decided, why don't we take that heat from the data center and pump that into the swimming pool? So essentially, using the wasted heat from the data center and heating the water. We also kind of want to do the same thing in the lab where we work. So it's a very old building. Um, it's about 250 years old, 300 years old. Um, it's actually owned by C Oliver Cromwell's son. So it's a very old building. The, the old building predates that. But it's a very cold building. And we have a data center which booms out a lot of heat. So something that I think would be really cool that we could do eventually is take that heat and pump it into the actual building itself. So Google is definitely on the forefront of renewable energy in their data centers. Um, in August 2017, they reached 100% renewable energy, not only in their data centers, but in their offices as well. So, and they also have definitely one of the coolest looking data centers I've ever seen. Um, Microsoft are playing with other experiments. So they're actually trying to put data centers in the sea, and they've now just reached their second phase. So they're planning to put the second one in soon. Um, the great thing about this is the sea is nice and cold, and you can cool your data centers with the water. Now, I don't know how this would work if we decided to put all our data centers in the ocean, but for a small-scale operation, it's a brilliant idea. Um, Apple is also on the forefront of renewable energy. Uh, they actually own quite a few solar farms, and this is their headquarters here. And as you can see, the roof is just solar panels all the way around. So Apple is also another company that's doing very cool things with their data centers. So, OK, so these cloud providers are doing things, but what can we do as developers to actually save energy, save energy on the cloud? So serverless is a cool technology. Um, they reckon in the next year or so, 10% of all applications will be running on serverless technologies. And the good thing about serverless is it scales very, very quickly. Now, that is a key factor in saving energy on the cloud. If you want to save energy, you need to scale down very, very quickly. Otherwise, you're just wasting energy for no reason. So microservices, how can they help save energy on the cloud? Now, if you take a monolithic application, and I broke it up into five microservices, and I just had them side by side, I guarantee you the microservices would use more energy. But if I scale that up to thousands of microservices that an enterprise um, company would have, then you are starting to start see energy benefits. So let's have a look at this graph. We have a graph here. So this is a normal data center with a monolithic application in some company's data center. And all the red is wasted energy, because you have to have capacity all year round to handle peak load. So if I take that monolithic application and I stick that on the cloud, now the red bit at the bottom, the red squares around the line, those are the parts that are, is wasted energy and wasted money. But if I break that up into microservices, as you can see, I'm wasting less money and less energy. So what does the cloud require? So fortunately and unfortunately, the world is driven by money. And on the cloud, money equals energy. Once you've built your data center and you've bought all the hardware and you've built the building, the main cost for cloud providers is energy. So if you can save money, essentially, you're saving energy on the cloud. So here's a graph. And as you can see, the ramp up time here, that, is, that lag there is cost. And it's cost for no reason. You're sitting there waiting for your application to start, and it's costing you money, and it's costing you energy. If the ramp-up time, you use more resources and it goes back down, that over-peak there is also wasted energy. So this is essentially what we want our applications to look like when we're putting them on the cloud. So to save energy, these are the kind of things the cloud requires. And can different JVMs make a difference to this? So who remembers this phone? Hands up. Awesome. Now, this is one of my favorite phones. Um, if you come to the IBM booth, we've got a very similar game uh, called uh, Liberty Bikes. So I used to play Snake on all the time. And this had an edition of Java called Java Me. And these are the requirements we had for Java Me. So small footprint. Um, you want the game to start very quickly. You don't want the first minute of the game to be lagging, otherwise you're going to lose, essentially. Um, and on these phones, we had very, very, very little RAM or ROM back then. So if we look at the requirements for Java in the cloud, they're pretty much the same. We want fast startup time. We want small footprints. And of course, everything we use in the cloud is costing us money. So if 
we can decrease the startup time and decrease the footprint. We're going to save money and, in return, save energy. So this is where OpenJ9 comes in. So this is one of IBM's, this is IBM's Java that we open sourced about two years ago. And it was one of the biggest open source contributions we ever did. Um, and we have been putting a lot of effort over the past few years to get the footprint down and the startup time down. So these are some of the results if we compare it to Hotspot. Um, again, using the Atom Time Compiler, it starts up very, very quickly, which is brilliant. So if you remember this graph, if we compare that to Hotspot, and if we look at this graph, as you can see, OpenJ9 ramps up a lot quicker. Um, and the good thing about OpenJ9, because it's been used by enterprises, a lot of IBM customers for years and years and years and years, has very good throughput, so you can handle massive amounts of data going into it. So here's some of the facts about OpenJ9. Um, I just wanted to focus a little bit on OpenJ9 just to show you what different JVMs can do in regards to saving you money on the cloud and saving energy on the cloud. And here's some people that have tried it out. It's very easy to try out. Um, we've got Docker images. And there's a lot of different contributors to OpenJ9, which is brilliant because it's all open source now. Um, all you have to do is change the from at the top of your Docker image to use essentially this JVM, and you will hopefully see the benefit straight away. So I'm going to give you some facts about some record-holding data centers. I don't want to just bore you about uh, different JVMs. So the Earth's biggest data center is in Mongolia. Um, it's 10.7 million square feet in size. That is an absolutely massive area, and it consumes 150 megawatts of energy. That's the size of a small city, um, and it costs nearly $3 billion to build. Um, Green Mountain is supposedly one of the greenest data centers in the world. Um, this is located up in Scandinavia, and um, what they did was, OK, it's cold up there anyway. This is in the Arctic Circle. But where, what else can we do to basically get free cold air to pump into our data center? So they built it deep inside a mountain where pretty much they require no air conditioning, no cooling whatsoever. There's just an abundance of cold air coming from the rock in the mountain. So this helps the data center save a lot of energy, um, thus saving us money, hopefully. It's also one of the most secure data centers in the world because that's where NATO have a lot of their, uh, their computers. Um, Facebook did something very, very similar. Um, they built a data center just 60 kilometers below the Arctic Circle. Um, the rivers there get very, very cold, so they could use this cold water to water cool their data center and make it very, very cold. Um, the cool thing about this data center, if you, you, um, if you go and look at the pictures on Facebook, it's all very blue and very gray. So not only does it look cold, and it feels cold, which is quite cool. So what I want you to take away from this talk is I want you to think about different ways you can save energy as a developer on the cloud. There's a lot of developers in the world, um, there's a, and a lot of things are slowly moving to the cloud. So if we code in different ways, and we test in different ways, and we change the architecture of our applications, we can hopefully save money for ourselves and our organizations, but then save energy on the planet as well. Because the scary fact of one-fifth of the planet's energy going to data centers is that's scary, to say the least. Um, I just want to say thank you for listening to my talk. Um, if you want to know any more information about this, please come to visit me on the IBM booth. And as Jeremy Clarkson once said on Top Gear, um, we need to save the polar bears. So thank you. <laughs>